Hello and welcome to Digest This, where we focus on clinical topics in gastroenterology. My name is Francesca Moroni, I'm one of the gastroenterology consultants in the north of Scotland. Today we are discussing refractory ascites and I'm delighted to have here with me Dr. Natasha MacDonald, one of the consultant gastroenterologists in NHS Lanarkshire. Welcome Natasha, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. So this is of course a very niche topic and before we dive in into refractory ascites, I wonder if you could tell us something about the development of ascites and what does this imply in the patient journey. So ascites is considered to be a watershed moment in the natural history of cirrhosis and development of ascites uh, marks a, quite often a turbulent course for the patient in the next few months to come with frequent hospital admissions, infections and other complications of liver disease. Um, ascites is the most common complication of cirrhosis, um, occurring in up to 70% of patients with cirrhosis after 10 years. And uh, roughly 5 to 10% of patients per year develop ascites. And so how does it physically develop and how then become refractory? So the pathos pathophysiology of ascites is quite complex and I think we now understand the main um, building blocks of the pathway that leads to the development of ascites but there's still a lot of unknown and in the past few years it has become apparent that uh, immune dysfunction and systemic inflammation play a, a key role in development and progression of ascites. But the, the primary event, of course, is portal hypertension. And ascites develops when the HVPG is around 10 uh, millimeters of mercury or above. Development of portal hypertension leads to release of vasodilatory molecules in the body, including nitric oxide, carbon monoxide, and endocannabinoids. And that leads to the splanchnic vasodilation. And that is the key uh, mechanism that leads to effective arterial blood volume depletion and hypovolemia and activation of renin angiotensin aldosterone system and CNS, sympathetic nervous system, and a release of arginine vasopressin that leads to sodium and water retention in the kidneys and development of ascites. We don't really understand exactly why some people develop refractory ascites. It could be simply progression of their liver disease, their kidney dysfunction and their cardiac dysfunction. And there are se several mechanisms that happen at the level of the kidney that we know contribute to intolerance to diuretics. Um, or resistance to diuretics. And um, there are three things that are commonly described. First one is that sodium and water reabsorption happens in the proximal uh, convoluted tubule and that's upstream of the action of frusamide and spironolactone, the two commonest uh, diuretics that we use. The other factor is renal hypoperfusion and a, a consequent reduction in glomerular filtration rate, causing rise in creatinine and type 2 HRS, and that limits our use of diuretics. And the last one is dilutional hyponatremia due to the non-osmotic release of arginine vasopressin and disproportionate reabsorption of water in the collecting duct. It's quite complex. Uh pathophysiology of the condition here. So once we have a patient with refractory ascites, what option do we have to treat it? So it is very important, uh, once the patient develops refractory ascites, we should always consider referral to our local liver transplant unit as a matter of priority, because liver transplantation is the only curative option for these patients and their median survival is frequently quoted in the literature as 50%, uh, six, a six-month survival of 50%. Of 
Um, so um, if a, a transplant is an option, that is the only curative option for these patients. What happens if transplant is not an option? Um, I suppose the next best option would be to consider TIPS uh, insertion for these patients. Uh, we know that in patients who uh, have the TIPS and manage to gain uh, control of their ascites, they uh, have better quality of life and nutritional status. And uh, there is some early indication coming from trials that it can also improve their survival and, and it can bridge them to liver transplantation if a bit of time is required for them to wait, for example. Um, the main problem with TIPS is that there are very strict uh, uh, contraindications and relative contraindications to TIPS insertion. So unfortunately, in real life, a um, very small subgroup of patients at the moment are suitable for TIPS insertion. So who should I not refer for a TIPS? Essentially, this is patients with very advanced liver dysfunction as indicated by their high MELD and UKLD and child PU score. Uh, people who have active infection, including dental infection, uh, people with significant renal dysfunction, pulmonary hypertension and cardiac dysfunction, and obviously patients with a, a very brittle hepatic encephalopathy, um, because encephalopathy could be significantly worsened by the TIPS. So patients may not be a candidate for transplant, may not be suitable for a TIPS. I know there's been a lot of uh, rumours in literature about the role of albumin and there's been a lot of controversies in the use of it. So mm -hmm. is there a role for albumin in refractory ascites? Um, so um, outpatient uh, long-term human albumin administration is, is one of the uh, most recent uh, developments in hepatology and um, the biggest study called the ANSWER trial uh, uh, looked at uh, patients with grade 2 and 3 ascites and compared outcomes compared to, uh, looked at the outcomes compared to the standard of care and the early signal that we're getting from this uh, study is that um, outpatient albumin administration improves uh, their survival at 18 months and reduces the need for large volume paracentesis and reduces the rate of development of refractory ascites. Um, there is another smaller study in a single centre that specifically looked at patients with refractory ascites and uh, administering human albumin solution uh, to them uh, at small numbers, but there was also a positive effect on survival and uh, the rate of uh, complications and hospitalisation. Sounds that like maybe there is some prospect for the future. Absolutely. But I see from you know what you said at the beginning, mortality is very high in this uh, cohort of patients. They've got very advanced disease. You know, you quoted uh, fifty percent of six months. What is the role of palliative care in this? So palliative care is very important and is uh, sometimes overlooked in these patients because uh, they don't have a cancer diagnosis. Uh, but in fact, they have a high symptom burden with breathlessness, abdominal distension, uh, early satiety uh, and abdominal hernias. And uh, these patients need to be referred to the palliative care team as a matter of priority. Um, it is also a, a important to um, review their medications to see if they, they can be optimized and nephrotoxic medication, sedative medication withheld. Um, and um, in patients with refractory ascites, we quite often stop the diuretics um, and some dietetic input and social work input is also important. So do we offer these patients regular large volume paracentesis as a part of their management and can palliative care aid the service for us? Um, so um, 
large volume paracentesis has been around for many, many years and is a standard of care for patients with refractory ascites who are not suitable for liver transplant or TIPS insertion. Um, it uh, can be done on an outpatient basis as well as on an inpatient basis. Um, and obviously it's a big undertaking for the patients because they need to come to hospital to have their drains inserted um, sometimes every couple of weeks um, and that uh, contributes to their poor quality of life, their poor nutritional status and is a big undertaking for these patients. Um, so uh, sometimes um, it is uh, important to think about long-term palliative acetic drains and again this is a new development in hepatology over the past couple of years um, really driven by um, very large numbers of patients unfortunately with end-stage liver disease and ascites and looking at how best to palliate their symptoms and target their um, treatment really to, uh, to their wishes uh, and, and try to ease the burden of repeated hospitalizations or attendances in the hospital. So the REDUCE study was published in 2020 and looked at feasibility of using um, tunneled long-term acetic drains uh, versus a standard of care, which is large volume paracentesis in a, in a, in a small sample size, um, but um, a, the main concern with this long-term drains is infection and importantly there was no difference in the rate of uh, bacterial peritonitis between the two groups. Um, the drains were found to be cost effective and um, all patients were covered with prophylactic antibiotics and interestingly um, all patients elected to keep their drains at the end of the 12-week study period so we must have been doing something right um, to improve their quality of life. So this is uh, disease of the end of life and we got several options may not all be suitable for all patients so we really have to focus on the patient's characteristics and so my question to you is when we see someone in clinic with refractory ascites, what should we not forget? I think it is very uh, important to um, treat the underlying liver disease um, and um, sometimes that leads to recompensation uh, of uh, ascites, for example, abstinence from alcohol or treatment of their viral hepatitis B and C. Um, so it is important that we have optimized the management of the underlying liver disease um, to, to the best of our abilities. I think it is also important to think about any precipitating factors uh, that led to the development of refractory ascites. And um, here I'm mainly thinking about hepatocellular carcinoma development and partial portal vein thrombosis, which can also be malignant. Um, so I think in some cases it is important to do imaging of the abdomen. And perhaps the most important thing is to have a frank discussion with the patient, uh, explaining the severity of their liver disease and the prognosis and um, to tailor their management um, to their age and comorbidities and to the patient wishes also. Thank you very much, Natasha. That's wonderful. And it was an absolutely delightful run through a very important condition. So what is left for me to say is to thank you and to thank you for joining us for Digestice.